Amen. Um, you all, all have this from today, right? I don't know that I wasn't too concerned about identifying the way marks that are happening in front of our eyes right now until we pulled all this information together. But it's, it's you know, the, if you were forced at gunpoint to say, is October 13th the midnight cry paralleling, you know, Exeter camp meeting in Millerite history, or is October 10th, or whatever variables that you want to put into what's happening in our histor history. To me, the evidence right now would be October 13th. And what this is, is this is, I don't know why Bronwyn did this. We had uh, um, evening worship at our home the other night, and I guess after this, she, she was inspired to do this. And this is a kind of a similar type thing to what Louis Weir did with the genealogy in Genesis and the genealogy in Revelation. And based upon Louis Weir's genealogies, then in the past we did a genealogy breakdown on Islam in the Bible where you take the names, you get the definitions of the names, and when it's all said and done, you, you create a, a run-on sentence with the definitions of their names and whether it's the genealogy, Genesis, Revelation, or Islam, the definition of the names of those um, tribes tells us their story, whether it's, anyway. So she went home and she just searched the publication, Signs of the Times, Review and Herald, for dates uh, for October 13th. So anytime Sister White had a publication, Review and Herald, Signs of the Times, she looked up October 13th, and she read them, but she didn't, she just summarized she, the title of them because it would be too much information to include all these uh, various publications. So that's what, that's what this is. Um, so this is just uh, another emphasis on October 13th. If you follow what I'm saying, the things that Sister White got published on October 13th through the years in the publications as defined by the Ellen White CD-ROM. If you go into your s smartphone and look on it and the, the publications that are under the, the category publications in there, anytime there was one published on October 13th, uh, that's what she did. So. Um, I guess I'll read this first few paragraphs. The following two references are the only ones that specifically place Sister White on October 13th. Okay, so these are the ones that they're speaking about where she was. They may be significant because she moved from east to west. She attended a camp meeting. It was a Sabbath day. The Holy Spirit rested on her and the people. There was happiness and a refreshing. I'm open to add additional insights and corrections. Um, so I think it's interesting that the two places that Sister White, you know, speaks about her here and now on October 13th are two different dates, but she's in the Rocky Mountains both times. Okay, Sister White crossed the Rocky Mountains westward where she stopped for a period of rest from fever and the shock of her husband's death. She continued to her son in San Oakland, California, intended and spoke at a camp meeting in Sacramento. And then on October 13th, 1888, seven years later, she crossed the Rocky Mountains eastward to attend the General Conference in Minneapolis. Um, the, sp the Spirit rested not only on her, but on people also. So, okay, so she's, she isolates these two as significant. And then by the order of the years, these publications, you can see 12 publications where she references October 13th. And, you know, she starts with the first one is 1874, 1881, 1885. So they're, they're in order. And then I'm not going to read all of it, but it's the title of the first one, October 13th, 1874, is The Temptation of Christ. And then she gives a, um, a little bit of summary of it. So I'm going to drop down to the page to the bottom where she, what she's doing is what Louis Weir did with Genesis and Revelation, what we did with Islam. 
she takes the summary from the titles of these publications and creates a, a run-on sentence which would be represent October 13th. That's the premise of this, and I, and I, I get it that um, this isn't the strongest prophetic argument that's going to be out there on anything. It's kind of like just sort of icing on the cake sort of stuff. Um, so he, the, I'm on the bottom of page two. This paragraph is created from these titles. We're now in the time period of the temptation of Christ. You may choose to travel in the downward path of Samson or in the path of the pioneers of the Protestant Reformation. The results of genuine conversion will be shown by heralding, heralding Isaiah's warning, copying the pattern of Christ, and manifesting a spirit of sacrifice in the work for this time. If you search the scriptures, you will find the truth, and it will have its power in the heart. We are counseled to not overwork, but to make the present truth message short for our listeners. Each watchman is to be thoroughly converted in this closing work with the duty of forgiveness upon him. So that's just a, an interesting take on things that were published on October 13th in the context of our October 13th this year uh, being the Midnight Cry. So what I want to do, the, Theodore's put, I'm sure Theodore's, you know, I, w I got a haircut on Friday, or, yeah, Friday, and in this hair salon, it's got one of these big pictures of Albert Einstein, and I'm, there's no way I'm comparing Theodore with Albert Einstein, but it's, it's a big picture, you know, one of these murals, but it, it's, it's one of these pictures where it's got a, an okay, f just his head, you know, big head of him, but all around it, it's got all these mathematical equations where, you know, on his face a little bit, but around him, where you can, it's implying he, he has all these thoughts, you know, running through his head. And of course, I had to look at it for quite a while while she was cutting my hair, and I was thinking, you know, that's, that's my problem with Theodore. Um, <laughs> you know, he's got these chronologies and stuff in his head, and they're floating around there, and he, he understands them. I can tell he understands them correctly and all, but for me to internalize this information and spit it out um, in a simple fashion where I understand it and I think the people that would hear me spit it out would understand it is a whole different story. So I want to lead back into his material and try to spit it out in a simplified fashion, but I want to back up either f even further um, than you might expect. And I want to make a, um, throw something else in the mix. Um, for this movement and this this school here. Before before Kathy and I went to Africa, long before, um, one of the things that one of the problems that the people that were trying to organize some of these various groups around the world, what they were seeing, and they specifically spoke about it. I wasn't seeing it so much, but Parminder and and Tabo were seeing a lot of it, and and we d had discussions about it. Is that in a lot of these places where this message is taking hold, there's a, a phenomenon happening, if that's the right way to say it, where it's the young guys, the, the, young, the youth that are taking the message and they're wanting to run with it, and it's causing a, a real problem because there's other people there that are already been in, in say, self-supporting work, already been doing this type of labor for some time, and as the one class tries to organize and manage the work, the young people are wanting to just run with it. And if the young people don't get their, their way about those things, then they, they, there's a tendency to start saying, well, you, you old guys, you're not keeping up with the message. And there's starting to be, there was starting to be friction to the point that they've been discussing these things. And, you know, how do we do it? It's part of the reason that we're, trying to get some help into Africa to where you can manage these things because you don't want to lose the, you know, the, Sister White tells us the work gets finished by a, an army of youth, mm -hmm. but a, if you read the whole sentence, what does it say? Right. Rightly trained, okay, you, so, so there's got to be someone training them. It's not just you turn the youth, youth loose to run hither and yon, and so when this came about, that's... I realize that some of that's been going on here. 
Okay. So, I, I, we went to Africa, we seen some of those conditions, understood it was happening, and then it come back here and, and we've been confronted with even a little bit of this phenomenon right here and now. So I'm going to put it in place. It, it seems to be something that's happened across the board. And one of the things that I worried about when this, not worried about, thought about, as Tess's material came to light and the, af and the aftermath that we've been dealing with with this message, and I, I'm, not, I can, I'm not saying that, I'm not making any accusations or criticisms at anyone about anything that I'm going to say here. But there seems to be a little bit of a, a discussion about, well, is, is Tess Samuel Snow? Or, um, you know, was Daniel Samuel Snow on October 13th? And no one ever said that. And no one's even, I won't even say anyone's inferring it. But that's there, you know, some of the... We're just trying to lay out what's happening, and sometimes it seems like some people are being defensive to, to guard Sister Tessa's position or whatever, and, and from my point of view, I've never had any of that. I'm just trying to put the points in place and move forward. Um, but what I've realized now, and this is, this is the reason I'm leading into this, I didn't want to lead into it without having a background logic for it, I'm seeing that th this is different than Samuel Snow, and it's, and it's the Lord's design that it's different. And what I mean by that is Samuel Snow, you can go back in that history, and uh, Theodore does it well when he goes over Samuel Snow. If, you get, if you're careful about his understanding, he was the one that was understanding almost everything in advance. Even if it wasn't getting marked down, he was, he was understanding the disappointment and stuff. So he, he was a singular guy that was being used to put together a message, and he didn't understand the message that well all the way up to the end. You know, he had, he was, he had the right message. The Lord was using him to put the right message together, but he was making mistakes in his application all the way along. But still, he was the one that was seeing the history correctly, but he was a singular guy. And my point is, is I don't think it's happening that way here. I'm pretty sure that what the Lord is doing is, is He's trying to demonstrate that the midnight cry message that was typified by Samuel Snow is being put together by a group of people. Um, even if someone like Tess is the, the, the cutting edge on putting together the basic lines, the structure that, that everything comes together on, um, I, what clicked for me was something, one, just one point, so I can illustrate this, one of the things that Parminder pointed out, and he and I know this mutually, in Italy, the second time, I had no reason to talk about how I used to oppose time setting, okay, it was, it was just talking about past history, I was purposely talking about the history of 1989 to 2001, because I was in, under conviction, I was pretty much the only person that had been there, and it was my responsibility to be given testimony about that history, and I'd have to go back to the sermon and look. I don't know what kind of logic led me into why I'm talking about opposing time prophecy so strongly through those years. But that brought Parminder going up there, and he wasn't planned. He's told me directly he wasn't planning on doing that, but because I said it, he responded. And what he pointed out, which is accurate, from that point on in this movement around the world, then people whether they felt free to start considering time prophecy or it was just a line in the sand that the Lord is going to start leading people to recognize these things. But that's when it all started. And from that point on, people start grappling with various lines that are pointing you know, to 2019, 2020, 2021, and, and beyond. There's people that are seeing lines up 2025, 2026. Um, but what Parminder pointed out is that Tess is already studying this stuff, and when did she start studying it? In December 2016, it gets opened up in Wales, okay? And initially when it gets opened up in Wales about Russia, I'm the one out there giving public commentary on what happened at Wales, because the very next weekend we were in Holland and I was teaching what happened in Wales. And typical of myself, I forgot the details. So I was out there for quite some time telling the story about what happened in Wales. And I was saying, you know, Chawatu presented all this stuff. 
And then I, uh, the people that were there reminded me, no, you know, it really wasn't Chawatu. Chawatu had some lines, but the conclusion about Russia, he was unfinished. And, and we all sat around there. There was Parminder and Manjin and Emma and Tabo and myself and Chawatu and, and Kimberly. I think that was, maybe there was another person or two, I don't remember. But it's like it's after meetings all day long. It's at 11 o'clock, past midnight. It was past midnight. And it's there that it all come together about Russia. And so it was a group, it was a group um, development. And so I left there next week and I'm giving Chawa to all the glory, so to speak. But then we realized that was a, a group thing that brought that light. So it wasn't one person. It wasn't a, a singular Samuel Snow. <clears throat> From that point on, evidently, to start studying this stuff, plotting away, um, that's December 2016. And so in Italy, we have this, this discussion, and then everyone starts looking at time prophecy. And, and Parminder's point is that when we, when we, he doesn't say it this way perhaps, but once the movement has the mentality that it's okay to consider these things, then we realize that the Lord has been putting together this thing uh, behind the scenes for a couple years. So you can see the Lord had his hand in this. But what I'm saying is, Parminder and myself, the people in Wales, they are players along the way, along with Tess. So when, when Tess finally gets here, um, I've already mentioned that it's providential why Heidi and Theodore are here. So Theodore's here to give a second witness, a confirmation to November 9th from a totally different, not line upon line approach from these calendars. Um, and then you got Daniel's activity and, and his expectation of something happening on October 13th and him for some reason noting that he, he get, gets his conviction on July 27th. And when I'm when I'm looking at these things, I'm seeing July 27th. I can't get away from July 27th. You know, that those are two dates in the prophecies of Revelation 9. It's the beginning and the end of the reign of terror, if I can say it that way. It's the beginning of the State Department in the United States. So if you remember, when I started in this and then I turned it over to Theodore, I was dealing with July 27th and we never have followed on on July 27th, and I intend to get back there. This is kind of the introduction heading back to that direction. So what I'm saying is, is that unlike Samuel Snow, I'm, I'm, it, if you didn't get it yesterday, I hope you got it, I assume you all did. George, what George was throwing in the mix yesterday, George Seaman, for those people that are watching this, this class online, you have to include in this class, don't just go from Theodore's presentation into this one. You've got to throw George's presentation at Lambert Church into the mix. And if you were following his logic, he, he may not have been using logic that I've been putting in the public record, but I've been putting in the public record in regard to time setting for some time now that in what I did at the camp meeting, that Abra Abraham is the first point of reverence for covenant people and he was tested on time and so was Moses and so was the time of Christ so were the Millerites therefore we should be but what he added to the mix which I think is based upon that structure um, is a, at least a couple things he's he's noting where numbers become symbols if you were following that and did you notice he I don't know that he missed it maybe he just didn't want to put it in but he told us when Jacob, you know, covenanted for his wife for seven years, that it was called a week. So he's saying, here's, here's the Lord introducing the idea of symbolic time. I don't know if he used those words. But if you read carefully that passage, what else does it say? When Jacob worked for her for a week, what was it? It was as a few days. Okay, so you've got seven, a week, and three right there in the beginning, and then he shows us later on that it's the gathering and the scattering. 
So in these covenant histories that we've been putting in the public record for some time, he's, he's confirming all that, but he's showing us that it's not until the right before the event happens that the message on time mm -hmm. comes to the surface. And I suppose you were all looking at it too if you were lining up the Millerite history about in, in those lines. Um, you got William Miller, but you have um, Josiah Litch, who would be the would be Josiah in the history that Theodore lays out in the Ezekiel study, and then you would have Ezekiel being Samuel Snow. They're lining up; those histories are lining up with Millerite history, and they're and they're addressing our history anyway. You can't leave that out, right? He gave enough witnesses that right before the close of probation, that's when you're told when, okay? And that's speaking to the here and now. My point about all that isn't his study, which you need to look at. My point is, is that this message is coming together by a group of people. It's not a singular Samuel Snow. There, there's just no way around it. Um, in my mind, when, when I went to Canada before we went to Africa, um, there's a brother up there that Tabo, he's one of the main guys up there in Canada. Um, and he, pardon me? Who you talking about? Colin? Colin. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't know if I wanted to put his name in, but it's okay. It's okay. Anyway, at the end of the meetings, it, there's nothing negative about this, so it's okay to put his name in. Uh, yeah, I couldn't think of it the other day. I can always remember his wife's name. It's a familiar name to me. Um, but anyway, he sh at the end, he shows me these, the, his conviction that the, the presidents of the United States go along the same line as the presidents of the General Conference. Uh, and, and I'm looking at it, and I remember way back when, in this class, at the end of a class, that subject came up two and a half years ago, and we could see it. We, we could see, hey, this is, this is, there's a logic to this. So we, we'd already, I was involved with a little discussion after a class once, way back when, um, where I could see the logic in that, but it never got carried on. So we get to Canada, Colin's been carrying it on. So I have a little bit of familiar with, familiarity with it, and Tabo's already probably heard it from Colin, but he, I guess maybe he's been not paying attention to it too much, or, or maybe he also wanted to see my take on it. So I, I looked it over, and he'd taken it further than we got in this classroom, and I, I says, hey, this is, this is interesting stuff. Give me a copy of your notes. So I took a copy of his notes, <clears throat> and then I never did anything with it, but from that point on, Tabo started grappling with it, and by the time Tabo gets to Africa, that's what he's teaching in Africa. <laughs> Tabo's convicted about these presidents. But more than that, the first place where we meet up with Tabo in Africa is Zimbabwe. And we get there to this camp meeting in Zimbabwe, and the, one of the main, if not the main guy there, a guy that has lots of articles in our newsletters, he's doing a presentation, and on his own initiative, he's come to the same conviction about the presidents, and that's what he's teaching. Okay, so this, this line has come up on the other side of the world from a... You know, without any, and I ask around, was there any interaction between Canada and Africa on this subject? That is that why he's teaching the same thing? And there wasn't. So mm -hmm. that contributes to what we're we're grappling with here. I, I hope I hope you're understanding it when you're talking about Tess's lines and what Trump's about to do. Um, and if you didn't catch it last week, it, you know. And the, the idea of Infowars, okay? And I know I had some resistance to what was going on here, but my resistance was is that I didn't think one stream of Infowars was, war was any safer than the other stream. I think they're both dangerous at one level if they're going to manipulate your, your understanding, but you have to watch them in order to pay attention to the events that are taking place in order to know that prophecy is being fulfilled. Um, but in the recent week, the people that are the pro-Trumpers, uh, until they caught that bomber 
you know, they were they were saying, you know, maybe this is a Democrat that's doing this, you know, to to turn the election upside down and make it, you know, making uh, self-inflicted wound to, to stimulate the Democrats to go out and vote, and then they catch the guy and he's a he's a Trumpster, and then the day was it? Yeah, it was Sabbath. Um, this anti-Trump guy goes in and kills all these these Jews in the synagogue. Um, but and my point is this: is if you were going to look at Infowars, you could see what's happening right now, and you you might be able to say it. It looks like there's this purposeful smokescreen happening right now because in those purposeful smokescreens, there's things usually that are going on behind the scenes. So you could say, who's orchestrating? what's been going on in the last couple of weeks in the United States with this caravan, with the bombers, now th this mass murder in a synagogue. Who's orchestrating this? And even if it isn't the liberal Infowar line or the conservative, it's Satan. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't catch it within the last week, when uh, Trump broke the, the nuclear arms pact with Russia, that should be ring a bell with what Tess was was sharing. Broken treaty. War is coming. And even people that don't understand that line out in the, the secular world, they're saying, you know, you don't break your those kind of treaties except you're getting ready to go to war. And you're not hearing anything in the United States about Trump getting ready to go to war with Russia. But if you listen to the Russians, they've been saying it for some time that the United States is is drawing us into a war. Um, so I'm just saying what we're understanding about this message, the external, it seems to be taking place, but it's hard to see because everyone's distracted about a, an upcoming election and all these things that just yeah. keep happening. What you are seeing is a lot of people um, trying to build up the military and that in, in itself is saying they know something's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm people that normally wouldn't support the, the build-up military, they are now. That's, it's all happening. Anyway, so my point in all that is, I guess, that this message is coming together from a lot of different personalities. The Lord's using a lot of different people, not just a singular person. And I want to put that in the record. And then I, and I'm doing it, believe it or not, this is an introduction. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched Habakkuk's tables, but in, and I don't remember the details of this <laughs> okay. study, but I want to point you back in your mind if you remember it, or you can go look at it if you've never looked at it. There's a study that we <clears throat> did about the year-day principle, and I think that was the title of it, the year-day year -day rebellion or something like that. And I pointed out that in that the foundation of the foundation of the, this understanding of the Millerites was the year-day principle and that if they were going to, or us as Adventists or the Millerites when they were going to teach these time prophecies, they had two verses in the Bible that they had that were their primary verses. Numbers 1434, uh, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, each day for a year for your, the time that the spies were taken out the promised land. And then Ezekiel 4.6. And my argument, one of my pieces of logic in that was, is that those two verses in Numbers and Ezekiel are the, the two witnesses to the validity of the year-day principle which the Millerites needed to put their message in place. And it says, and we still use that as Adventists. If we're going to teach someone about the 2300-year prophecy, we're going to have to go to those two verses. <clears throat> but I went a step further. I says, we never teach in Adventism that those two references of the year-day principle are identifying full-blown rebellion. Okay, full-blown rebellion at the beginning of the covenant relationship with ancient Israel, right there when they come out of Egypt, full-blown rebellion, that year-day principle is part of that story. And then Ezekiel 4, 6, had they kept the Sabbath, Jerusalem would have stood forever, but they're in full-blown rebellion, so Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Not only that, if you take the even though it's the first time Jerusalem's destroyed, you have the prophetic license to say, okay, that's the end of ancient Israel. Therefore, Ezekiel 4.6 is identifying the end of the covenant people. And he, in 
Numbers 14.34 is the beginning. So you've got the beginning and the end of ancient Israel. You have rebellion. And what's associated with it is the year-day principle of Bible prophecy, which is the foundation of the Millerite movement. Okay, so from there, what we did with that, if you're, and I, th I hope this is what we did. This is how I remember it. Um, we went into Millerite history because in 1863, one of, the, one of the lines of prophecy, and I'm making the assumption that everyone in this room is pretty familiar with this message. In 1863, there's a lot of fulfillment of prophecy that identifies 1863 as a waymark. It's, it's probably the most secure waymark that we have as Seventh-day Adventists, even though Adventism doesn't even know it's a waymark. But when you go look at all the things that you can line up with 1863, one of them is, is that James and Ellen White lost their youngest and their oldest son as they approached 1863. And it was a fulfillment of the curse upon the man that would rebuild Jericho. Okay, when you go in the Bible, there was a curse on who was going to rebuild Jericho. He was going to lose his youngest son when the foundation was laid. It may be when the gates was set up. It's one or the other. And his oldest son when the gates or the foundation was laid. I don't remember the, which was which. But when you come to the time period of 1863, you can see the, the youngest son dying when they begin to discuss um, an organized church, and you can show an organized church is the gate, and then you can see the oldest son dying um, when he's laying upon the freshly published 1863 charts, and he catches pneumonia and dies, and that's the foundation. So you can see this story about rebuilding Jericho. So my point is, 1863 at one level is Jericho. Okay, so in the year-day rebellion of ancient Israel, they were rebelling about going in the Promised Land, which means conquering Jericho. That first rebellion for ancient Israel is, is associated with Jericho. And the last rebellion is associated with the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel 4-6, Sunday Law. So the logic I was trying to put in place back then is that in our history, the rebellion that establishes the year-day principle in ancient Israel is repeated in modern Israel with 1863 being the rebellion of Jericho, if I can say it that way. And then 1863, um, what's getting set aside first and foremost is the 2520. Okay, so when we get down to our rebellion, where, we're, we're, where we are repeating a Seventh-day Adventist, a rebellion that comes right before the destruction of Jerusalem, then I would suggest that we would have to also be in rebellion to the 2520. So at that point, that gave the logic in the study to go in and show that even the theologians of Adventism identify that the very first reference of the year-day principle is in Leviticus 25 and 26. And when you see that, when you see the, the structure of the land resting every seventh year and the jubilee cycle in Leviticus 25, and then you see the blessing and the cursings in Leviticus 26, and you realize that Miller was right. He wasn't, he wasn't looking at the Hebrew of what is translated as seven times. He was looking at the context of Leviticus 25 and 26, and this was, even if he didn't understand fully what he was doing, that's what he was doing. And here we are at the end of the world, and we're being confronted with the 2520 again, and we're in, re we're in rebellion to it. So what I'm saying is that the rebellion that's taking place here at the end has to do with rebellion that was typified in ancient Israel and what's associated with the rebellion at the beginning and the end of the ancient ancient Israel is the year-day principle mm -hmm. and what comes to us here at the end is a rebellion of Jericho when the 2520 is getting set aside and when you see that in 1863 and it takes you to 1989 suddenly you're getting confronted in this message with the number 126 and the number 151 and here we are at the end of the world and the rebellion that's taking place just before Jerusalem is once again it's wrapped up in the year-day principle it's wrapped up in time and so I, 
so I wanted to put that in place. The reason I want to put that in place is when I get to the point where I'm going to th repeat Theodore's lines, I want to carefully go sh through, if I can, and show this, the, the very elements of time that are in those lines. Okay, The story of Ezekiel, which would be the first mention of the 391 and a half that we know of, is followed by Revelation 9. Okay, and it's already been put in place here in our studies, but I want to remind us of that. In Revelation 9, when you're looking at the 391, what's some of the things it's teaching us? Okay, one of the things I'm saying it's teaching us that we have to grapple with is that it was Julian and Gregorian calendar. Okay, that's part of the testimony, is that the Millerites have shown us when they come to understand that message, that we're going to have to grapple with Julian and Gregorian and rabbinical and biblical calendars. Okay, so that's a testimony there. And also, I agree with Theodore, although I've always hoped that he was wrong. But if you were, if you caught what he said the other day, I mean, it, it, he's totally right. There was a time where I went to London, and we had meetings in London, and I went two days early so that I could go into the London... Um, museum and get in their ar archives and look and see if there was anything that actually w got recorded on July 27th, 1449. And I spent a whole day in there looking through their archives and it's really difficult to do. Because if you're going to go back into the newspapers of 1449 in those kind of archives, you don't go look for July 27th, 1449, because if something happens in the world on July 27th, 1449, it doesn't get recorded in a newspaper for two or three months later, because what took place on the other side of the world, they're not hearing about it on the television or on internet. It take, it's getting reported out, you know, two, three months out, you're, you, they're telling you this happened in July 27th, and I still don't really understand what a bank holiday is, but in England, in Europe, they have things called a bank holiday. So I only got one day because the other day was a bank holiday. It's not a, I don't know what it is, but the museum was closed. But holiday. it's a bank holiday, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, and the, and the, the point is, is that I've never found, and I've looked, and I know people that have looked, I've, there's never been discovered anything that actually happened on July 27th, 1449. Okay, which is the end of the 150-year time prophecy, but it's the beginning of the 391 um, and 15-day time prophecy. So I kind of hope that Theodore is wrong, that there is actually a piece of history that comes to light, you know, that, but the reality of it is, is at this point, he's not wrong. And therefore, that history is also teaching us not only that we have to grapple between Julian and Gregorian, but it's teaching us that Waymarks can be waymarks simply by a date. If the date can be established, it can identify a waymark without any direct specific historical evidence to line up with that waymark. And, and that's part of, of what we have to acknowledge when we grapple with these calendars that he's bringing in, that sometimes these dates, you know, what is it, June 15th, 2017? What is that? Okay. <laughs> what happened on June 15th? Who said, do you know what I'm speaking about? Are you, have you been following along in this class well enough? Where the, the 391 and a half days comes to a conclusion in 2017? Uh, it's the June 15th. Yeah, so the 2017, from 2017, it comes to June 15th, 2018 on the Julian. And we start. Yeah, I get that. But what happened in and the Gre and what June happened on the Gregorian? And and then June fifteenth on the Gregorian, we just count one hundred and twenty days. To yeah, but what happened? What historical happens. event happened on June fifteenth, two thousand seventeen? But it is the second day of the fourth month. Yeah, that, that's that's my point. Is we have to come to an understanding that in the Millerite understanding of Revelation nine. They were willing to stand upon the idea that a date was marking a waymark without an event to establish that waymark. 
and I know that we've we challenged Theodore a little bit in here about you know why are you picking that date? Well, because it works, all right, and it does. Is that November nine? No, but maybe if you bring all the three ninety ones together, then it would be November ninth line up no, on no. that. No, no, I'm saying isn't that what we're doing with November nine? No, you got you got lines of prophecy with November 9th that have a history that here at the beginning that come to November 9th and it's speaking, it's identifying things that you can expect to happen. Yeah, All right. Still, we don't know what will happen. I mean, we 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 know that it will be fulfilled, but I get her point. It's well, it's, you it's may get her point, but <laughs> All right, but don't miss my point is that in Millerite history, one of the, the lessons that I think we can derive is they were using the year-day principle, but they were grappling between calendars, and they put in the record that it's okay to mark a waymark by a date without an event to uphold that. Yes? Okay, you follow me? Um, so... I covered George's input. Did everyone, everyone was in church yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you get the same conclusion about that that I was getting? Because he didn't say it unless he said it in the afternoon when we weren't there. <coughs> is that the evidence line upon line is, is that you don't get the year, day, uh, month opened up to you until you're right at the end. Okay, so the fact that it's opening up may... And another thing, just, I don't know, I won't say the, whether this is valid or not, but it seems to make sense to me. And I'm not talking about a literal number, 144,000 or anything else, but the Lord is about to make up the number of the priests. At midnight, he's going to have a priesthood intact. Foolish priests on the wrong side, wise priests are intact. So, in the terminology of Am Adventism, he's making up the number. Okay, do you follow me? And then you can show that a, a line of prophecy that corresponds to that event is Gideon, where he's making up a number. Okay, so there's a number being made up. Um, you, can you buy that at just a simple level without, uh, you follow me? So what I'm seeing here, for me, is that right at the point where he's making up a number, right before the close of probation, if we're going to put it in the context of George's presentation, that the issue that he's inserted is time setting. And this issue <laughs> is so such a, wh what was George saying? Absurd, not absurd, wasn't it? But um, he used, what? Preposterous. Preposterous. This is such a preposterous idea for Seventh-day Adventists. You know, there's been, there's been people, I, we, Kathy and I have watched all the people that get close to this message and jump ship. We may not remember them all now or their names, but we've watched it happen through the years. And we know that lots of them have been sitting there waiting, just waiting for an excuse to say, ah, they're, now I, they're really in darkness. This proves it. They're really out in left field. Now they have this preposterous, idea that they can take. Oh, they're setting time. And it isn't just Brother Jeff in disagreement with Brother Parminder. Now Brother Jeff is disagreeing with himself. Okay, they, They've got all, all the evidence they need and we as Seventh-day Adventists know there's never going to be another message hung up on time. So at the very point where he's making up the number, he's brought in the subject of numbers, of time setting, and I'm seeing that this issue is what is sealing them off, preventing them, it, it preventing that other class of ever connecting with this message. It's, there's a logic to it with the way the Lord works that seems to be valid. Um, if you understand that most Seventh-day Adventists are naturally they've been naturally trained to oppose time setting. There is groups in Adventism that have set time all the time, uh, for a long time, but I mean, generally speaking, that's not the case. All right, um, so, did that. Um, 
That went faster than I thought. Any questions? Yeah. If you go to the last plagues, God reveals the day and the hour just in the last plague, just before He comes. I think mean, that's another evidence. Yeah, but where George started, it's the last plague, he gives a day and hour, but fourth plague, he starts speaking about time. He starts, it wasn't just singular. So, so he's, there's even a little, and, but the plagues, how, fa how long do they last? You're just talking about days, okay, even if you want to focus on the last one. But he begins to introduce the subject of time there. That, that, that was really a cool observation. Um, in those lines. So, where we are is scary. Um, and I don't know, maybe no one liked the idea, but I tried this once, and then Nathan had me fix it the next day, but it never went back up there. What's the date today, the 28th? So that'd be 29, 30, 31, right? Is it 31 days in October? Yes. And then 9, that's 12, and 365 is 377? I don't know. We should make a counter with seconds. Uh, seconds. Oh, I <laughs> is that it? Pardon me? <laughs> okay. Um, did you print out Theodore's? No, I sent you one after that. After I sent you that, Theodore sent me his email. And I forwarded it to you and said, print that out. Um, Yeah, why don't we do that and, and get st started. Theodore sent me an email this morning where he has the, the various lines cleaned up from where we were the other day. And I, that's what I was going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through his lines in a way, a simplified way. Um, you know, he gets the chiasms in him. Um, and stuff like that, and I, I get lost. I don't mind li putting the chiasms in after you've looked at the singular line in a simple fashion. Uh, but when they're all up there together, and he puts all the, the, the various dates, uh, I'm going to treat those dates as, okay, this is established now. Okay, so we can put the one date we want to put on that way mark, it's established, and we don't have to put all the other ones where we can just look at how the lines correspond with each other. And uh, I th think he has that um, prepared for us. Um, and I didn't look that closely because it was, was late. Um, and what I intend to do with those lines so you know where we're going in this introduction, is I intend to take Tess's revolution lines and put them up there and then tie in the American Revolution and the presidents. That's long time ago we were there when we got to the, the Trump understanding and we seen there was seven presidents followed by ten presidents to get to George Washington and we started grappling with that. And what we were grappling with is that 1789 wasn't just the beginning of the Constitution and the first president, it was the beginning of the French Revolution and then we seen the connection between the two and we know that Sister White talks about the French Revolution being repeated. So maybe, maybe Tess's line is just exactly how it's supposed to be, but if you remember her line, um, in her revolution, preparation, counter-revolution. You remember how she had them structured? I'm not, not going to try to change that structure at all. But in the beginning of the French Revolution, the whole period in the revolution that leads to the preparation and then the counter-revolution, do you follow what I'm saying? 
Um, she ca calls the whole thing the reign of terror. But in reality, the reign of terror is at the very end of that first block of time. And the reason I want to focus in on that is that's where you have July 27th. At the beginning of the reign of terror and at the end of reign of terror. And I, and I want to see if there isn't some kind of prophetic connection with July 27th. And I thought Sister Kathy emailed me something that she showed me. Uh, but she didn't. She emailed me something else. And here's what I thought that she... I'll tell you this. I'm sure July 27th is something that we have to wrap our mind around because the things about July 27th, if you remember where we started into this study after Parminder left and I took over, my point of reference was July 27th. At that point I did not know that Daniel had got this conviction on July 27th. And at that point I did not know that um, on July 27th this year that the State Department passed the Potomac Declaration. Okay, so Antonisia came up and she told me that after one class. She said that on July 27th the Potomac Declaration was passed and Antonisia was just speaking off the top of her head, in that, uh, that's how I'm in a good way saying it. it, as she's telling me about it, she says, I think this was uh, Justinian's decree. Okay, Justinian's decree is 533, and it comes right before 538. And it identifies the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. Okay, so I got her logic, that was easy enough. Um, and she sent me the references to the Potomac Declaration and she had about four or five links and I took two of them. I looked at them all but I took two and I, th that's one of your handouts. You have that? Mm -hmm. And the one is just describing the Potomac Declaration. Potomac. Potomac. Potomac Declaration. But the other one is talking about how, what's his guy, uh, what's his name, Pompeo. Is that his name, Pompeo? How he's expecting the Pope to be the, the moral authority that implements this declaration. And it's a, primarily Islam is the argument to make this declaration about blasphemy laws. Okay, so after that, um, declaration. Now, now follow this. We see this, Antonisha does, and off the top of her head, if I'm correct, if I'm not correct, if you knew about this, what I'm going to say, then you can tell me, but I'm pretty sure it was off the top of her head. She says, I, I think this is the decree of Justinian, just because of the prophetic logic. And then Kathy goes and she looks at this more deeply, this declaration, and it comes... Its point of reference as, as a law comes from the Napoleonic or Napoleon era, the Napoleonic Code 1804. of 1804, but the Napoleonic Code of 1804 is based upon the decree of Justinian in 533. So Antonisia evidently just from her understanding of the prophetic structure suspected that this was a decree of Justinian in our history and then Kathy traced it down and you never emailed me those links what you emailed me was about the Potomac oh, okay. the stone because I pointed out to her also when they were building the Capitol building in the United States um, the Pope of Rome sent this, sent this great big chunk of marble over that they could use in the, in the Capitol building and the Americans took it and threw it in the river. Okay, they didn't want anything to do with Catholicism, but here we have the Potomac, Potomac Declaration at the end of the world and we're lifting up the Pope, okay, right? The very river where that piece of marble went at the, you know, in the 18, I don't know when they built the Capitol building. So you see the logic, and, and she's going to send us the links where we can, 
where we can see this connection. So I'm saying July 27th, um, when Brother Daniel comes under conviction that on October 13th, the midnight cry message is going to be put in place or whatever his conviction was. And for whatever reason, he, he says, I'm going to write this down for myself. So he has it, you know, stored on July 27th that that's where he came under the conviction. I'm saying there's evidence about July 27th being a waymark, and July 27th for me connects with July 27th, 1789, with the formation of the State Department. It wasn't called the State Department back then, but it is now. And um, this, this connects with the French Revolution, okay, this, this history. And there's, there's, you know, a direct connection with France and the French Revolution. The, the biggest hero of the, of the American Revolution was John Paul Lafayette, a Frenchman, okay. Um, so, I have the dates here. Um, Seventeen ninety three, July twenty seventh, Robespierre, Robespierre, how do you? Robespierre. Robespierre, he's set up in power, and the reign of terror begins. And the reign of terror goes for basically one year. I mean, there's all kinds of blood being spilled, but the actual reign of terror goes until Robespierre dies himself when he's overthrown one year, eleven, one year later on July 27th. So you got in this initial history, you got July 27th and 1789, 1793, 1794. We got July 27th down here where the decree of Justinian is being put in place and where we're recognizing that on October 13th, the midnight cry is going to come into history. Um, and that is connected with what? July 27th, 1299, and July 27th, 1449, which is the prophecy of Revelation 9, the 150 years, followed by 391 years and 15 days prophecy, that leads you to where? August 11th, 1840. Okay, and this here, how do you do this now? Is it 1840 times, no, it's 2001. Yeah. 2001 times 360 equals 72360, is that what it is? divided by 1840 equals 391.5. Therefore, therefore, this 391 prophecy is connected with 1840 and 9-11. Right? In 1840 and 9-11, and I'm not, I'm not, S Sister Alyssa came up and, and wanted to chastise me a little bit in the camp meeting um, about me saying that the foundations were laid in 1840, 1842, but they were. I don't care what, what Brother Parminder's teaching. And what I told her was this. Most of the time that people come to me and they have a, something that they've learned from Parminder that appears to be contradicting something that I'm teaching, not, at this point I'd say all the time, not most of the time. It's, it's simply understood that Parminder is taking a symbol and he's applying it this way, but it's still okay to use that same symbol and apply it over here. So my response to her was, you know, you need to handle that one with Parminder. But if he's showing a foundation laid from 1844 through 1850, so be it. But it does not deny that you can demonstrate that this is the symbol of the foundation of Millerite history. And you've got a bunch of witnesses to support it. When 
Cyrus is, is vacillating on his desire to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, an angel comes down named Michael and gets his head on straight so that he lets him go back. And so when that angel comes down, then the foundations are laid in Jerusalem. You got tons of witnesses. When Jesus is baptized, he's going to pick his initial disciples, which Sister White says were the foundation of the Christian church. So when the symbol comes, the divine symbol comes down in 1840, the foundations are laid and you can show quotes in the context of the spirit of prophecy where this represents the foundations of the Millerite history. It's not a denial of Miller's rules. Symbols can have more than one meaning. So there's a foundational work right after 1840, a foundational work after 2001, and it's telling, it's telling me, I hope it's telling you, that this prophecy is connected with both of these and I think if you were going to put a name on this prophecy, what name would you put on this prophecy? For this, if you were going to symbolize this, what would you name it? Josiah. Josiah. And it, it's just simple to see, um, I think. Because what did... Okay, I see a hand. Uh, that's a Brittany thing. Uh, if you it's what? Write, uh, what I'm going to share. If you can write Numbers 1434 on the board. <coughs> Do I need the numbers or just 1434? 1434. That's the year the principal we numbered. And then you're That's the, the year what? Year, year the principal in numbers. Yep. Numbers 14. Yeah, okay. And then 0406, that's a Zico 46. Right next to it? No. No. Nope. Oh, right. 04, no. Yeah, 0406. Okay. And you add. Can you make the math? Whoa, can I this? 18. Yeah, but what's your justification for throwing two placeholders in? Because it's Ezekiel 4 6. You know, you cannot make it. But it's not Ezekiel 46. It's not. It's not. It's Ezekiel 4 6. Ezekiel 4 is a 4. No, no, no. The two point. No, it's not there. Okay, I get it. That's cool. Um, so, Josiah, he became a new, you, you go to Habakkuk's table, he became a, uh, a subject of this movement. If you, do you remember what we understood about Josiah in that prophecy? We didn't understand it the way that it's illustrated in Ezekiel that Theodore has been putting in place. What did we understand about Josiah? Does anyone remember? First off, I'll ask Daniel. The Daniel is, has tunnel vision about one symbol. So, what did we under, what, what's one of the things that we understood about Josiah? About in regard to no, just about Josiah. Josiah, that he's the one that gives the prophecy of 391. And he no, okay, you're not getting me. We came to understand that the last seven kings of Judah were the seven thunders. And that Josiah was one of them. And of those wicked kings, he was the only one that even tried to do a reform. Now we understand that he lines up with uh, a general conference president named Pearson. The same one before the end, and the only one that tried to do a reform. That's just a minor thought, but he, he connects in that way. But when we understood the story about Josiah, we understood that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy of the disobedient prophet, that came and cursed Jeroboam. You remember this study? And what happened to the disobedient prophet? He wasn't supposed to go, he wasn't supposed to do nothing but go home, right? And where does he die? Pardon me? So, who is he? In the study, who do we come to understand he is? The USA? He's pointing out Islam and... False prophet. Um, the false prophet. No, the, the, the false prophet was the prophet that sent his sons and said, go bring him back to eat and drink with me. And he'd been told, don't eat and drink with him. The false prophet, apostate Protestantism, was the one that lured the disobedient prophet back to his home. He's us. He's who's us? The lead blood. 
Adventism. He's Adventism, okay? And Adventism was broken away from apostate Protestantism in 1844, you know, for lack of a, a better thing, you know. But this is important. Um, I won't go there. Maybe I'll go there in a minute. But when he ends up dying, where does he die? This is Adventism that dies, and the reason that they die is because they return to the methodology of apostate Protestantism. They're eating and drinking their theology, right? That's what we came to understand. Do you remember that way back when? This is the prophecy of Josiah, but where does he die? It's because he's eating the methodology of apostate Protestantism that he gets to the point to where he doesn't know any longer know what the lion is or the ass. And what's the lion and the ass? King of the, North and the King of the North and Islam. Adventism goes back to apostate Protestantism, accepts their methodology, eats their food, and is incapable of recognizing the two primary points of reference in end time Bible prophecy, Islam and the King of the North. Do, do you all remember that? Or did you never know, hear that? It was before your time. Okay, so what I'm saying is in this movement, you can check it out in Habakkuk's tables. I'm sure that it's in there. We came to see Josiah fulfilling this role, and he's doing a work of reform. You know, the disobedient prophet says there's going to be a Josiah raised up. He's raised up 350 years later, and he does this work of reform. And he wants to have a Passover. And if you haven't settled into this, I want to point out, Theodore said it a couple times, but I've said it to people after the fact, and it doesn't seem like it's clicking, but it should click. You should get this in your head, I think. At least it makes sense to me. I don't know how many there is, but I'm going to say there's less than 10 Passovers that are marked in the Bible. And you, you know, you can figure... In Christ's time period, you've got uh, most of them right there. But they were to keep the Passover, but there's only certain Passovers that are specifically addressed in the Old Testament. So there's really not that many Passovers that are in the Scriptures that are therefore a, a his history that you can put with the way mark of Passover. Do you follow what I mean? So there's so few Passovers that the few that there are, uh, they should be of significance. Okay, then one of them for us is 2 Chronicles 29 and 30. They want to have a Passover, but it took them 16 days to get ready, so they couldn't have a Passover. So they're going to have that Passover in the second month. We know that one. That's a significant Passover. But another one is, is Josiah's Passover. Okay, so in order to do the Passover celebration, what did Josiah have to do? He had to repair the temple. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is already in this message. And when he repairs the temple, when he begins to build the temple, can you say it that way? When do we begin to build the temple? Well, we, at 2001, the Millerites in 1840. Okay, the foundations are going to be laid. So the, the building of the temple is associated with these two dates, which is about the 391, which is Josiah. But Josiah, he's got, to, he's got to clean the temple up. And what's his high priest find? The law of Moses. And so some people like to keep it just at that level. That's what the Bible says. But what did he really find? He found the 2520. Because he realized that they were, they were under the curse of Moses. And he, in sackcloth and ashes, he repents. But he knows it's too late. He's the fifth from Zedekiah. You know, he, he knows they're already at the, the end of the road. Therefore, what did we do with that in our application? We put the discovery of the 2520 after 2001. Was it, didn't it come after 2001? 2005? Did it come in 2005? You think so? <laughs> Just hold on. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the 2520 is rediscovered in 2005, but we're talking about Josiah. What are we saying about Josiah? That this would be typifying when the work of the temple reparation for Josiah, but building the temple for us, is underway and we discover the law of Moses. Yes? 
You're all with that logic? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we used to teach when we would teach that. But remember, we would teach things, but we were going a thousand miles an hour and never, never spending a great deal of time at any point in time or really developing it out. But what I, want to, what I want to show you here now is one of these things. Okay. This is 391 and a half years in Ezekiel. Yes? So, 391 years, 6 months. Is that right? But this one in Revelation 9 is 391 years and 15 days. Okay. So what's the difference between this and this? One's a half a year, one's a half a month. <laughs> you're giving me a grammatical answer when I'm asking you a math question and you're the math guy. What do you want? 165. What? Well, it's five months and 15 days. Days. One hundred and eighty, one hundred and seventy-five, one hundred and sixty-five. <coughs> yeah, so one hundred and sixty-five days. But if it's a day for a year, if you go to eighteen forty, oh, yeah. and you treat that as a day for a year, where does it take you to? Two thousand five. When the law of Moses is discovered as typified by Josiah. Are you seeing that? Okay, so Josiah is probably how you would um, that's the name you would put on this, is what I'm saying. And what does Josiah mean? Foundation. Josiah means foundation. 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 Yes? Okay, and, and that's, other than this little math thing, that's all old news. Or, you know, it's already in the public record. But we've, we've forgotten it. And what Theodore has done for us with Ezekiel is... Uh, put it in the context of this 391 and a half and it's it's um, very profound okay so I haven't looked at these yet he sent them this morning I'm not going to try putting them on the board I'll put them on the board tomorrow what I he's simplified it out he says but when he says that sometimes and I look at it maybe I don't think it's so simple maybe you do um, but the, the punchline for me, what really nailed this down the other day, um, is Theodore had shared with me directly, and then I watched them in a couple camp meetings over the past couple years. I, I want to point something else out, too. What I'm saying about this, this element of time that's come in, and it corresponding with, to the point in time when he's making up the number of his people, and that this is the doctrinal stumbling block that is going to sever off anyone that's in the valley of decision about this movement and finalize the wrong choice for those people that have left already. I really believe that. I believe it in the sense also that the last shaking was going to be on the nature of Christ. You could show that prophetically and it came, okay, right on schedule. And it didn't just come right on schedule. For me, it came right in the same geographical place. Where I was educated on the nature of Christ was in Eatonville. Okay? And Eatonville became the point of reference for that argument here at the end. So for me, it was the beginning and the ending of, of my so-called public labors uh, 
And in, in the context of Sister White saying those people that are studying prophecy recognize that the doctrine of the Incarnation is invested with the soft light, and that's at the end of the world, and that the Sabbath was invested with a, a halo at the beginning of Adventism. Therefore, you have a beginning and an end, and the doctrine of the Incarnation is the end doctrine, causes the final shaking. The final shaking arrived right on time. It was a, a tip, typified by the Holy Flesh movement. Sister White came to understand about the Holy Flesh controversy while she was in Australia. And when this all started, we were in Australia and we started hearing about this. Um, coming out of Eatonville saying you need to not put Parbender's stuff on the web. He's teaching error. So there's so many things that, that were confirming that that was the final doctrinal shaking. And, and here we are now. What I'm saying is this number issue, time setting, whatever you're going to label it. It's, it's binding it all off as the Lord's making up his 300. He's making up the number. But I will point out that even though I'm, prob I'm much more vocal publicly about my inability to follow Theodore's presentations, and, and, and maybe it's not me. Maybe he just needs to learn how to teach a little bit better. Let's just put it at, at that level. Maybe in here, and I'm saying this about a guy that is a university professor. So he, he's, I haven't ever been trained in teaching and he has. I've never got a paycheck for teaching and he has. So I got to, you know, qualify what I'm saying. But I've, I've struggled with following his logic, but I've always, I've always got it. I've always got it from the very beginning when I would, the first time I started interacting with him and watching him public. So at this, I want to point out that when the final two personalities that left here left, whether you recognized it or not, their protest was being raised against Theodore in this classroom. And it, and it, it was an unreasonable protest. It was a satanic protest. And I would, I'm arguing that it was, none of us really knew what it was about. But, but God knew that this secondary witness to what Tess put into place about November 9th, it, it had to have this secondary witness. And in advance of that happening, Satan made an attack to try to prevent that avenue of testimony coming in. It, I think I'm trying to say that, it, that what we're understanding about the calendars is serious information, important information, and that Satan even made an attempt to undermine that. And, and we weren't even aware that it was happening. And it was happening at the identical time when the people that were opposing that were starting to manifest that they held the Catholic understanding of original sin and the, the nature of Christ. So the final separation, the final shaking has taken place, I'm thinking. And here we are in agreement with George's logic yesterday that just before you get to the close of probation just before you get to the destruction of Jerusalem, that's when the Lord's going to tell you when. Okay, so I, I, I want to put that in place and then tomorrow um, I'm going to try putting his lines on the board in a simplified fashion. Once we understand them in a simplified fashion, then I don't mind bringing his secondary chiastic structures into it. We should understand those. But what I want to do with it is tie it into Tess's revolution lines and the reason I'm going there, I'm telling you in advance, is July 27th, okay, to connect it. Um, and connect it with, with what the State Department is doing now. And uh, even, if we, even if we're at the point to say that, you know, the message of the midnight cry, and, I, and no one's saying this, that's Tess's message, period, okay? No one's saying that. What I'm saying is it isn't, that the Lord... It still has layers of truth to put on, on top of that. And there's something about the French Revolution that I'm not sure what it is. And the presidents. That's, yeah, let me put this in place. At the same time that Tess is, is putting her lines in place, this idea of the presidents... Go ahead. Oh, I didn't, I didn't want to stop the train Okay, the ideas of the presidents is coming into fruition at the same point in time. So let me tell you something that when I was illustrating in a camp meeting, I put the presidents of the United States on top 
and the general conference presidents on bottom. But if I would have did that visually, it would have been easier to see that it's 2019. Okay, but you may not know it, but there's an argument against, that says there was 20 kings in Israel, in the northern kingdom. And I've never bought into that argument, and, and I just never did, because when I started looking at the kings for myself, the number 19 fit, because I seen the number 19 at the beginning of the 2520, and it just, there was a logic to the number 19. And you can go into the, the chat rooms that discuss this, you know, the Jewish, the Christian chat room. Was there 20 Hebrew, or 20 Israel kings or 19? And I, I'm just very briefly going to tell you the justification for why there's only 19. Okay, the, the reason that they'll say, tell you that there's 20 is there was one king that there was, <laughs> just denied my premise, there was a guy, Tibney, Tibney uh, I'm going to just call him a guy, he goes in and he slaughters all the, the king's family and the king, it, only one fa family member gets out, Joash, okay, and, but he's only, he, he slaughters him and within seven days he's dead, okay, because they, the, the people realize his conspiracy and they're going to kill him and he goes into the palace and burns it down around himself. But there are some people that are marking the kings of Israel that they will include him. And if you do that, then there are 20 kings of Israel. Therefore, everything that we're saying about 19 Republican presidents, it comes tumbling down. Zimri. Zimri is the guy. Uh-uh. Yeah, yeah. Zimri's valid. It's, it's, oh, it's Tibni then. Tibni. He, it's, yeah. This guy I have here that Zimri reigned for seven days. Well, it's Tibni that reigned for seven days. You got that? No, I think it's Tibni who reigned at the same time as Omri after Zimri killed those people. In any anyway. case, all in right. Case we get it. Here's the logic that I want you to see it's in this history that this guy slaughters the king. And seven days later, he's dead. And some people will say, well, he was a king. All right. And this is Jeroboam 1 here, the first one. And I'm saying the seventh one is Ahab. So this is the seventh. This is the first. So you're going to have two, three, four, five, six. But some will throw in this seven-day guy in here. Okay. And I'm saying prophetically, you know it isn't right. Because you can show, and we've did it repeatedly through the years, that this here is the seven thunders. This is 1798. This is 1844. Ahab is confronted by Elijah. And Sister White says Miller was typified by Elijah. Okay, so in the history of the Millerites in this time period here, apostate Protestantism has rejected the message of Miller, and it's identified as the false prophet, the prophets of Baal, the priests of the grove, at the very point in time where Millerite Adventism is being identified as the true prophet. We put this in the record for years. Therefore, based upon this how solid this is, okay? Ahab has to be the seventh king in the seven thunders. Therefore, including one person in here that was around for seven days is a hook. Yeah. A, a hook to hang your doubts on. If you choose to do it, you can do so. And if you, if you do so, then you can argue that what we said about 19 Republican presidents is inaccurate and therefore Abraham Lincoln does not typify Trump and all kinds of things begin to crumble. I, I also like the fact that you're bringing in July 27th because for me it was, there was a little bit of an unbalancedness in the propaganda machines that are being used and to me that just balances out the the information that we're going to be receiving. That, this is based upon the conversations that we've had, me and you. Yes. So when you're saying that, you're leaving off part of the story. What? And I, it, Everyone's heard our conversation. No, we're not. The, the, <laughs> no. the unbalanced being, I don't like the way you said it. The unbalanced right. being 
<laughs> See, I'm balancing, and it's just coming from the, we got to listen to the liberal, but actually we have to listen to, I mean, the, the conservative. We, we can't be... You should be listening to either one of them. We, but what I'm saying is July 27, when it opens up the state, Department. Department. Yeah. It shows us that the the propaganda machine comes from all directions, and yes. that we have to. Okay, but in order to do that, for me, then you have to go into the French Revolution, where the first Protestant reformer dies on January 21st at a certain spot, and 258 years later, the King of France that killed that first Protestant reformer, although it's a different King of France, he dies on January 21st, same place. So January 21st becomes associated with a spot and Hillary signed in as the leader of the State Department on January 21st, 2009 in the time period of the proxy war that's been typified by the proxy war from 79 to 89. And she, John Kerry, and now Pompeo are all accomplishing this whatever is represented by July 27, 1789, the role of the State Department and therefore you have both the liberal and the Republican influence at the State Department and they're both doing dirty work. Okay, so that's what, what you meant by imbalance. I just don't want to alienate anyone. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, you've opened up a great deal of light here in the recent past and we wish to be able to begin to pull some of these um, threads of truth together um, and we have not very long a couple weeks of class to accomplish that work in we ask that you'd continue to give us direction and guidance um, as we attempt to pull these things together and as we attempt to simplify some of the more complex um, concepts mathematical concepts uh, that we can all be prepared to go out and teach these things. Um, it appears that there is smoke screens in the the world going on right now that are preventing most people for from seeing things that are going on behind the scenes. We thank you that your prophetic word is giving us um, some insight behind those curtains, uh, but the insight is scary. Not only do we have a limited amount of time, uh, but we have a great work to do here on planet Earth. We ask that you to let this message have the impact in each of our experiences that you've intended uh, that we might become fit vessels to carry this message to planet Earth. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.